see a few people coming in. Uh, welcome to the session of San Diego 101, Becoming Scripps, Scripps Ranch. We'll get started in just a few minutes. So those of us who have just come in, welcome in. This is San Diego 101, Becoming Scripps Ranch. We're gonna get started with the actual webinar in just a couple minutes, let a couple people, let a few more people have uh, time to come into the room. Do you want me to uh, open my PowerPoint now and use that as the opening screen? Sure, that sounds great. Looks like we've still got a few people coming in, so we'll give them another couple of minutes and then go ahead and just get started. To enable participant screen sharing from the uh, still can't open it. Maybe can you open the uh, participant um, screen sharing so that I can put up that oh, yeah. opening okay. slide? Thank you. Great, you should be good. Ahead there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So looks like it's kind of stabilized a little bit. Um, thanks for your patience, folks. Welcome to San Diego 101 from the San Diego History Center. Uh, this session is beca called Becoming Scripps Ranch and is presented to you by Linda Canada. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time, welcome in. If this is uh, you've been here before, welcome back. 
Um, and a big shout out to our members and our donors who make programs like this possible for us to put on. Uh, we'll have you here with us till 1 p.m. Linda will present her talk, and then we should have some time for some questions at the end. Please put the questions in the Q&A function as they come to you, uh, and we will answer as many as possible at the end of the talk. So that'll just be um, down at the bottom. Um, feel free to use the chat to say hello, make any sort of comments, share a story, share a connection, anything like that. But please use the Q&A for any questions so that way we don't end up accidentally missing something. Um, so we're gonna go ahead right now, get started with Linda's talk. This is being recorded and will be made available online later. Uh, so for you, Linda. Okay, um, you're breaking up and Katie and freezing up. So I'm just gonna go ahead as though you told me to go ahead, okay? Um, okay, good enough. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to what is a, a brand new talk for me. I gave it two days ago and people seem pretty happy with it. Um, it was requested by a resident of Scripps Ranch who wanted to know a little bit more about his community. And so I went ahead and, um, and prepared a talk that Katie thought maybe you guys would like to hear about as well. So let's, let's start out with who in the world was Scripps and why is there a Scripps Ranch? Um, the image that you see in front of you is an image of E.W. Scripps when he was um, 68 years old. And he um, had this portrait painted with his um, famous cigar in his hand. He was noted for smoking cigars and drinking a lot of alcohol. But at any rate, let's get back to the history of his family, which is quite interesting. Um, E.W. Scripps father was a bookbinder in London and um, he had a, a shop and the, he lived over the store. He married a woman, they had a couple of children and then she died in childbirth. And so the father pretty quickly uh, found another woman to marry him. And the one thing that he was really good at uh, in addition to bookbinding was fathering children. And so in seven years, his second wife delivered six more children. A couple of them died, and uh, then she died of breast cancer. So when things changed in London and bookbinding was becoming more mechanized, um, the Scripps father, James, decided that he was going to take his family over to the New World. He had had some relatives that had moved uh, ahead of him in time to the plains of Illinois, so in 1844, he gathered up six children between the ages of three and 13 and took them by himself aboard a ship across the Atlantic. Then they took one of the, uh, the ships that tra traversed the Great Lakes. They were, ended up in Chicago. They took up two covered wagons and went to Rushville, Illinois. He bought a farm there. He put all the kids who were old enough to work on the farm, whether it was milking cows or cleaning things or uh, planting and, and gathering crops. But along the way, he also managed to find wife number three who took him on with these six children. And then in the next seven years, delivered him five more. So E.W. Scripps, the man on the screen, was the last child born to James Mogg Scripps. And he was born in Rushville, Illinois. And he was a very difficult child. He was sort of oddly shaped. He had what was known as a cast over one eye, meaning it was not clear, it did not focus. He had a hard time focusing in on people. He had probably what were some learning disabilities because uh, between his physical ailments, which included rheumatism and arthritis at a very young age, uh, E.W. Scripps never went to school. He uh, was ended up being taught to read and to do some basic sums by his elder sister, Elizabeth, are you ready for it? <laughs> Pardon me, not Elizabeth, but Ellen Browning Scripps. Ellen Browning Scripps, who was 18 years old already by the time E.W. was born in 1950, pardon me, 1854. So his elder sister sort of helped with some of his schooling 
she had been able to get some schooling herself in between the time that her father required her to work on the farm with all the other children. She and her older brother James had been able to go to what was known as the Rushville Cemetery, but then James got called back to work on the farm. And so um, Ellen uh, went back to work on the farm as well until she got a little bequest from one of her grandfathers and she was able to attend uh, what was called Knox College. And so her tuition paid by her grandfather, she was able to complete all the courses, including science courses, including mathematics courses, all the courses required to get a degree, but she was not awarded a degree because she was a female and they didn't do that at Knox College. So she went back home to Rushville. She became a one room school teacher, lived with one of her um, 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 sisters who had children at that point. And so she lived with her sister. She taught during the day. She cleaned house, she cooked, she cared for the sister's babies at night. And so that was how Ellen Browning Scripps spent her early years. And so um, her youngest brother was growing up without any formal schooling. And by the time he was about 11 years old, one of the older brothers, James, had moved to Detroit. And first he got a job as a publisher of the Detroit Evening News. And then he became the owner of the Detroit Evening News. And he promptly sent home to Rushville and said, send me workers. And so as many kids as were able moved up to Detroit and went to work for James at the newspaper. And that included 11 year old E.W. Scripps. So he still really hadn't had any formal schooling, but they found things that he could do to help out the job. Now, Ellen Browning thrived in this work environment. She worked in the office. Um, she kept the books. She kept everything organized for her brother who was continuing to buy other newspapers in the area. So the family, although they were living in a very poor manner because James was such a tightwad, they live in a house that had no running water, no electricity, and was right next to the train tracks because it was a cheap place to live. But they did well together as a family and they continued to buy newspapers and everybody's doing very well. The family's getting older, the kids are getting older, the babies finally stopped coming. And so, you know, they're, they're a complete family by about 12 kids at this point. The dad is still back in Rushville, but Detroit really becomes sort of the family home for the rest of the kids. Now, one of them, an older sister whose nickname was Annie, also had the same uh, rheumatism problems that EW had. And so she had traveled west to go to a utopian community in the city of Alameda, California, up near San Francisco. And when he was about 36 years old, E.W. Scripps decided that he was going to take a break from the newspaper business, and he was going to go across country to visit his sister Annie and to kind of get the lay of the land and figure out what it was like um, to be in California. And so he took a train out west. He ended up in San Francisco and was able to visit with her. She was pretty seriously ill. In fact, they weren't even sure she was going to survive. But E.W. was not a terribly sympathetic guy. He was more curious and, and really bombastic about wanting to learn things. He knew of his learning disabilities. He knew he didn't know a lot, but he didn't want anybody to know it. And so he boarded a ship from San Francisco came down to San Diego. And so in about 1890, that's the point at which E.W. Scripps arrived in San Diego, rented a horse and buggy, and um, decided he was going to go around and see what this community was like. Um, he rode all around the back roads in this horse and buggy. And a lot of what he saw looked like this image, which actually turns out to be part of the image of the property that he eventually bought. It was dry land. It had no trees. He was in, let's face it, in Illinois, he was used to rain and trees and winter, and he didn't see any of that. In fact, he loved it in San Diego because he was here at the very beginning of the year in January, and the temperature was already up to 60 degrees, and he would never have found that in Rushville. So he delighted in the property and he kept sending telegrams back to Ellen Browning scripts in Detroit saying, you've got to come out here. We've got to buy some land. 
He convinced her to go in with him to buy some land. And so together, Ellen Browning Scripps and her brother E.W. Scripps bought 400 acres of land in what would eventually become the Scripps Ranch area. Now, this image shows you in red the area where they purchased their land. And I want you to notice that um, there is a lot of gray, a lot of gray places that are um, listed on this slide. And these are ranchos that had been um, uh, uh, perfected by either Mexican or Spanish citizens in the early, early, early years of European conquest of California. And all of these places in the gray had water. But the Scripps property, guess what? It did not have water. And so um, he could get this land fairly for cheap, but he didn't really realize what the problems were until they started working on the land here. Now, excuse me, go to my next slide. So the area where he bought the land is can be shown at the diagram at the top of this, the page. So the large area that's a rectangle in blue is the land, the 400 acres that Ellen Browning and um, E.W. Scripps purchased. Now, mind you, it's laid over a modern map of the area just to give you the location. So from upper right down to lower left, for example, the road that you're seeing going down is Pomerado Road. You notice adjacent to the blue property up to the uh, right is a yellow property that was uh, owned by a family named Vassy. And Vassy and Scripps and the other family who's diagrammed on here, the Jessup family, they all lived in the area, but the Vassy family came first. So the Vassy family first homesteaded 160 acres, which I have indicated on the diagram here. Um, and um, they found that they could not make a living on this land. It did not have enough water. And so where they tried to farm initially, that didn't work. Uh, then they had, uh, they were beekeepers. They had an apiary, uh, but that didn't work well because the bees didn't have enough flowers to take the, the, the stuff from to make the honey. And so the Vassy family was really in pretty poor shape. Down around the area where the triangle, the red triangle is located at the, at the left-hand side of this image, is the location of where the Vassys had a small amount of other land. And on that land, they were able to build a little general store. Um, they had a post office. They had a few cottages for rent. And that area today um, is, uh, is where Miramar Road is located at about Kearney Villa Road. And so uh, the area where the Vassys settled and had their, their store and their post office and their housing was technically called Miramar, but it was known as Vassyville in the area because of all of their ownership there. The other family is the family that occupied the kind of gray or greenish color a um, uh, smaller bit of land between the Scripps and the Red Triangle. And that area was the Jessops. They were also an English family. Um, they bought 50 acres that was known as the Burton Ranch. And they were told, oh, it's got plentiful water. Well, it was a 180 foot deep well that was dry when they arrived. Um, so they had significant trouble with their land as well. In fact, um, the the Jessup family, um, uh, the boys in the family, some of them went to work for Scripps. Um, one of them went to work for Vassy at the general store, but the father decided he had to get down closer to where there were more people. So he actually moved down to the, the area that was settled around today, what we call the gas lamp quarter. And because he'd been a watchmaker in, uh, over in England, he was able to start uh, fixing watches and clocks. He would go out into the ships that had come into the bay and fix their chronographs. And so Jessup was able to make some money and eventually move his family downtown. And as the years passed, the family did pretty well. The image on the right-hand side of, of this slide is the Jessup's clock. Some of you may remember it. 
It was first located in the gas lamp quarter. And then when Horton Plaza was built in the and opened in the mid 1980s, the Jessup's clock was moved into the Horton Plaza and was there for many years. It's now been put back in storage um, by the Jessup's family because the plaza has been repurposed uh, and is no longer a shopping center. This is a diagram of the ownership interests um, in the area of Scripps Ranch. And mind you, from the looks of it, it looks like there's a whole lot of people um, who were living out in the area. Not the case. Again, this is an ownership diagram. And so in the, in the upper, um, in the upper, let's see, let me give you a pointer here so you can see things more clearly. In the upper left here is this original land, the 400 acres that was purchased by Ellen Brownings and E.W. Scripps. Next to it is the land, the 160 acres that the Vassies had. But you see a variety of other gray colored in places on this diagram. These are all properties that Ellen Browning and or E.W. Scripps purchased later. And so you see little blocks with a Scripps name all throughout here. So eventually the Scripps family owned about 2,100 acres. A lot, but a lot of it was these little parcels that they sort of linked together. Now they had a problem, you know, during this whole time in that they had a lot of land, but they didn't have a lot of water supply. And so it was difficult for them to get water. You can see one of the stream beds that crossed near the Scripps Ranch property here. And so they were always looking for ways to create a reservoir in order to hold the water that came down these streams during the winter time. So it was the water that was the limiting factor on development. And one of the reasons that you see so many names of people out here owning properties of land is that during San Diego's boom and bust cycles of the 1880s and into the 1890s, people were buying land. They just had, it was an investment. It was, uh, you know, it was, they were on the come. They were hoping to make a lot of money from the land. Unfortunately, many of them ended up selling their land to E.W. Scripps because they realized that nobody else was going to pay them even what they had paid for the land to begin with. So lots of landholders, but E.W. Scripps and Ellen Browning Scripps became major landholders in the area where he was going to build his new house. This is a topographic map, and so it gives you a better idea of what the land was like. Um, when you notice E.W. driving, uh, coming and looking at the Scripps Ranch area, he was in a very flat area and he had to drive up the hills to get to the spot where he eventually built this house. So this is the location of the Scripps Mansion. Um, and you will notice that there are reservoirs, um, reservoirs, a dam and a big pond another dam and a big pond. So Scripps was very aware that he was going to have to conserve water. There were streams that were coming down these canyons. You can see how the contour lines tell you the closer the contour lines, the steeper the property. So you can see there were areas where the streams could come down. In fact, the irony of this particular diagram or this, this plat, uh, contour map is that this is labeled Carroll Canyon, and that is the name of the physical uh, uh, canyon area. But the road that has basically this same route is called Pomerado, just so you know. On the other side of what was Highway 395 was that little town of Miramar I mentioned, which was actually the home of the Vassies, and this was known as Vassieville. And to the west then is the road which E.W. Script built. Um, and so this is the Pomerado Road and Miramar Road intersection. But here is that ranch house, uh, pardon me, that the, he called it a ranch house. In fact, he named it Miramar Ranch was the name of the house. So Miramar Ranch built by Mr. Scripps starting in about um, just after he bought his first land in 1900. He sent for his brother, Frederick Tudor, and he asked him to come help him plan and build the house that would be located here. So Fred started building, and when E.W. finally got to look at what he'd done, he wasn't terribly happy with it. You see, 
Fred Tudor was kind of one of these guys who had big ideas, but he didn't really um, put them into practice. He didn't implement them very well. And in fact, Frederick Tudor uh, kind of liked the looks of one of the Scripps girls that was living right over here. So he eventually married 21-year-old Emma Scripps. He was about 40 when he married the 20-year-old Emma Scripps. And uh, E.W. Scripps was so frustrated by uh, Fred Tudor Scripps' inability to follow through on things that he bought the couple some land on the edge of Mission Bay on the Pacific Beach, the north side of Mission Bay. And uh, they built their own house over there. It was quite um, an extensive mansion, which they named Braemar. And uh, so they were there from the 1920s until about 1980 or so when the Catamaran Hotel bought the property and put up their hotel building. Um, Fred Tudor and Emma went to live elsewhere, sold their land, um, but they wanted to keep one part of the house. And so the dining room for, from their house, Braemar in Pacific Beach, was moved over to um, Garnett Avenue. And today you can rent it out. It is uh, where you can have a wedding or you can have special events. It's located on some unused U.S. government land adjacent to Rose Creek, fairly close to where I-5 is today. Well, I'd like you to meet in person, Ellen Browning Scripps. She's actually fairly late in her life at this point. Um, Ellen Browning Scripps came out from Detroit and helped her brother E.W. with the purchase of the land. And she helped him with ideas for the development of the house at Miramar Ranch. Um, but the family did not live at Miramar Ranch until it was close to completion. And so uh, Ellen Browning Scripps and other members of the Scripps family basically lived downtown. They lived in an area that today we call Bankers Hill. It's, their house was about at 4th and um, oh, Maple Street in downtown. It still stands. It is known as the Brit Scripps Mansion. It is a historically designated house. And the Scripps name part is from the Scripps family that were the second owners, Dr. Britt, actually built the house. So, so E.W. Scripps moved around a lot, first in his horse-drawn carriages, uh, then as uh, automobiles became available, he bought automobiles. When he realized it was too rough to drive his automobiles uh, up to the ranch house, well, he built roads. And when he wanted to go visit Ellen Browning Scripps at her new home, which she built, over on the shores of uh, the Pacific in La Jolla, well, he built a road over there too, and that became the basis for Miramar Road today. Now, Ellen Browning Scripps had always worked for other people, whether she was working for the newspapers, whether she was a one-room schoolhouse teacher, whether she was caring for kids and cleaning houses and doing the laundry, she had never lived by herself. And so at age more than 60, she finally decided she was going to build this house on the shores of the Pacific, and it was going to be the, quote, girl's house. And so her sister, Annie, who had actually survived her illnesses up in Alameda, came down to live with her, as did the sister that was known as Virginia Scripps. And Virginia Scripps was quite the character. Um, Virginia Scripps invited a friend, for example, to come visit her at her home there in La Jolla. And then the two of them decided that they were going to go downtown by way of the trolley car, which at that point, um, the trolleys had extended all the way out to La Jolla. And Virginia said, let's go downtown and go shopping. So they got aboard the trolley car and then her friend said, oh my gosh, I've left my purse in your house. And so Virginia said to the trolley driver, well, wait, you've got to wait a minute so my friend can get her purse. And the driver said, well, excuse me, but I'm on a schedule here. I can't wait for you ladies. You need to take a later trolley. Virginia said to her friend, run and get your purse. And Virginia went outside and laid down on the trolley tracks until her friend could come back with her purse. And then they could continue on um, to downtown to do their shopping. Now back to uh, Ellen Browning Scripps for a moment. Ellen Browning Scripps absolutely loved living on the seashore. And so in this image, you can see 
uh, people gathering sea mosses, um, gathering shells, uh, admiring the birds and the sea creatures that were out here. So she had a great time living on the shoreline, which meant that uh, in later years, when she and E.W. were approached by William Ritter and his wife, Mary, a physician, to help fund the Scripps Institution, what became known as the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, they were uh, eager participants in, in this philanthropic uh, project. And so Ellen Browning came, uh, came late in life to the shores of the Pacific and, and loved it there and uh, used some of her fortune that she had amassed working in the newspaper business to help fund the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Now back to the Miramar Ranch site. This is an aerial image taken in 1929, and the plane is just about over the Scripps Ranch property. So, the, pardon me, the Miramar Ranch property that Scripps had completed. So you get an idea of the location of the property and its distance from La Jolla, which is over here on the, sky, the, this, the far edge of this photograph, downtown La Jolla, pardon me, downtown uh, San Diego cannot be seen from here, but what you can see is a lot of very flat and fairly undeveloped land. Now you notice that there's some very uh, interesting horizontal and vertical lines in this area. This is the former site of the uh, Camp Kearney, an army base that was built in the area just below Scripps um, house at Miramar Ranch, built in 1917. Uh, continued until about the early 1920s, even though the war had ended and the training of the troops at this base had ended, uh, they still were using it for uh, mustering out the men who had served in the army during World War I. The hospital facility remained in the area, one of the last parts of this, uh, of this army base to go. And so here was where rehabilitation um, went on for men who had been um, uh, injured during the war. You can see part of Scripps Road going out to Miramar so that he could go see his sister out at his house. Now, mind you, Ellen Browning Scripps was he, the major educational feature and factor in E.W. Scripps' life. She took him under her wing when he was only a child and taught him to read. She instilled in him a love of books. She um, helped him to try and control his, his anger, his uh, frustrations. And she was an advisor to him from a business standpoint as well. Uh, and so E.W. Scripps made a lot of trips over to visit Ellen Browning Scripps at her home in La Jolla. In fact, he had a direct telephone line installed from his house to hers so that he could either inquire of her opinion on things or to get solace from her when he wasn't feeling particularly happy. Now, something to notice from the topography of the land is that there are streams that come down from the hills and go all the way out to the sea. So you've got San Clemente Canyon, you've got Rose Canyon, you've got other streams that are headed out to the sea. So when we think about where did the Scripps house, which is up here on the sort of rolling hillside, where did they get the water in order to plant the eucalyptus trees and to plant the housing, uh, pardon me, to plant the gardens that surrounded the houses up there? Um, they, it, they were able to impound the water that was flowing seasonally through these streams. The fact that they're kind of shiny and we can see them tells me that this image was probably taken during um, the short rainy season in the winter time. Now Scripps's house took a long time, nine years to finally complete. And sometimes he would go by horse and wagon up the hillsides in those early years to the roads to get up to the very top of the hill where this house was being built. Here's an image of him. Um, he's uh, kind of an odd appearing duck, even for the Victorian era. He always uh, had a full beard. He commonly wore a hat and um, he was just kind of a, a different kind of a guy. 
Here he's standing in front of the house. We can tell because of the, the wood um, that has been prepared for the outside of the house, but in, he's standing in front of one of the many rose bushes and rose trees and roses that his wife, Naki, uh, uh, insisted would be planted up at the house. Here's another image of the house around 1900. Um, by 1903, he was doing a lot of planting up here. He was helped by a young man who came to town. Now, mind you, E.W. Scripps had to figure out what was going to grow up on this very barren hillside with very little water. And so he consulted with one of the experts in town at the time, a woman who had a horticulture business named Kate Sessions. And so Kate Sessions came up and looked at the grounds, looked at the water supply, tested the earth for him, and made some recommendations about plants that he could grow up here, which he immediately started planting. Eucalyptus trees he fell in love with. He had 27 different varieties of them. Today, of course, those of you who live in Scripps Ranch know about the eucalyptus trees. Uh, but anyway, Ellen Brown, uh, pardon me, uh, Kate Sessions was a good confidant and an advisor to E.W. Scripps. So when a young man came to San Diego, he'd come down from North Dakota to try and live with his uncles and get a job. He was just in his young teens. And he showed up uh, because he had farming background. He was referred to Kate Sessions, thinking maybe that he could work in her growing grounds. Well, Kate Sessions didn't even have time to meet with him, but she liked the idea of him. So she wrote a handwritten note and had it delivered to him and, and advised him to go visit Mr. Scripps up at Miramar Ranch. So that's exactly what Chauncey Jarabek did. He went up to the Scripps property. Scripps hired him on the spot. He lived at the property for seven years and was in charge of helping Scripps with planting the grounds, arranging the grounds, taking care of the plants, deciding where the plants were going to go. So those of you who live in Scripps Ranch know that there is a Chauncey Jarabek school. There is a lot of recognition of Jarabek in town. And that's why he was a tremendous help to Scripps in his early age. Now, the family rarely got together once uh, E.W. Scripps and Ellen moved to San Diego. However, um, their brother, George, who had been involved in the newspaper business and stayed in Detroit, um, was not in good health. And the family decided to use one of their private train cars to move him to uh, Miramar Ranch so that uh, they could be around him and, and, and help him in what turned out to be his final illness. The family came together when George Scripps died after only a few days at Miramar Ranch. But in this image, you get to see all together in one place, E.W. Scripps in the center, next to him, his beloved sister, Ellen Browning Scripps, and next to her, Virginia, the young woman who lay down in front of the trolley tracks. So behind Scripps, and it's not by any happenstance, it was most likely deliberate that Fred Tudor Scripps, who had married Emma and moved out to Pacific Beach, where he was behind E.W. Scripps and not even in um, you know, clear sight of E.W., who really was kind of ticked off at him. The woman that you see is one of the few images we have of Naki, uh, E.W. Scripps's wife. Now, Scripps family recycles names. And so Naki was a nickname for Natalie. Natalie married E.W. But when they had their last daughter, they decided to name her Naki, which sounds just like her mother's nickname. But Naki, the nickname is spelled with an I-E, and Naki, the person, is spelled with an E-Y. So you have two different Nackies, one generation apart in this family. This young man is very important. This is Robert Payne Scripps, and he ends up being the major heir to the Scripps um, resources uh, when E.W. finally does pass. Um, so you have Naki, and interestingly enough, in the back here, you have Brother James, who um, was also 
the Detroit News, uh, Detroit Evening News uh, owner who expanded the Scripps newspaper network and who gave that job to E.W. when he was only 11 years old. So the family is together again. And this, by the way, is one of the few images that we have of the interior of the ranch house at Scripps Ranch. This is an exterior shot. This is the major interior, well, patio, the buildings housing 49 rooms are built around it. So this is the Miramar Ranch mansion, 49 rooms, 17 bathrooms. Each one of the Scripps brothers and sisters had a bedroom plus a suite, plus a bathroom, plus a telephone line. Um, in This doesn't look like a really large patio area. It's almost three quarters of an acre in size. So it is huge. In the background, all the trees, every single tree that you see has been planted. It is not native to the area. So this is how much the Scripps work uh, improved and, and added to the beauty of the ranch house. In the very distance, you can see the car barn. Back here is also a horse barn. Naki, Scripps' wife, raised Appaloosa horses. Um, there was an aviary back here. Uh, but something of interest inside this circular area where they used to have family parties, there is a fountain, and it's a little tough to see here, but this fountain was purchased by E.W. Scripps in St. Louis when the St. Louis Exposition, kind of like what we had here in Balboa Park a few decades later, but when the exposition closed in 1904, E.W. bought the fountain and brought it out here to install at Scripps Ranch. Some other artwork you can see here, a puma statue. And in the back, there are two of them. These are the work of a, a very famous sculptor named Arthur Putnam. Putnam works are throughout San Diego. E.W. liked his work so much that he put him on retainer so that he would always be available to, uh, to build more uh, sculptures for the Scripps family. Here's one of the few pictures of the interior of the house. And mind you, this is a picture taken how the house looked, but it was taken almost 30 years after the death of E.W. Scripps. And see what happened was E.W. Scripps completed his house. He loved the house. They went out riding on their horses. They went out hunting. They went out and admired the streams and the valleys and he explored everything. Um, and he pretty much became very stay at home once the house was uh, completed. But he was um, not in good health physically. He was drinking quarts, plural, of bourbon a day. He was drinking, some say up to 50, or he was smoking up to 50 cigars a day. And at some point in early 1917, he became aware that he could no longer make his lips purse and close onto the cigar in order to draw in the smoke. So then he finally went to the doctor, was told he was in horrible shape. His heart was in bad shape. His circulation was in bad shape. Unfortunately, he couldn't take action quick enough and E.W. Scripps had a stroke in late 1917, which partially paralyzed him. He was able to recover with a lot of physical therapy done here at his home at Miramar Ranch. Um, but it really changed not only his physical status, but it also changed him mentally. If he was angry and a buffoon and boisterous before, he was even worse after his stroke. He became particularly withdrawn from and angry with his wife, Naki. And uh, by, by 1917, 1918, 1920, he had really decided he was leaving the property. And so he really was not there much at all. He had bought a hundred foot long single gasoline engine ship called the Kema, K-E-M-A-H, and he used that to explore places on the East Coast that he had not been before. So he would travel back and forth by train across the country, but then he would go to the Kima and for as long as the Kima would, would run, they would go visit. But the Kima was very unreliable. It was always breaking down. 
So Scripps finally got frustrated and he bought a 200 long foot long ship called the Ohio powered by diesel engines. And at that point, he could travel as widely as he wanted to. So he did not make it back to the Scripps Ranch property, uh, the Miramar Ranch mansion. He did not visit Naki. He did not visit his children. Uh, and he died aboard ship off the coast of the country of Liberia in Africa. He had left instructions to the captain that if anything untoward should happen to him, he, he should be prepared for burial at sea and buried before his family was told of his passing. Now, the captain did tell them first, but he buried Scripps. So Scripps was buried without much ceremony with the workers who were on board the ship at the time, and he was buried. So he died in 1926. And his, um, his son, Robert Payne, who I showed you, who was a young man in 1900 when that group family photo was taken, uh, he was the main uh, beneficiary of the funds. And so, for example, it was only um, a couple years later that Robert Payne was then in charge of all of the scripts holding. Now, the property sat there in the middle of the estate. There was money to run it. There was money to keep on hire the more than 100 people that it took to care for the plants, to care for the house, to care for the furniture. And oh, by the way, that included a whole little group of Japanese people who were caring for plants and were indoor workers who had a separate place to live on the ranch. And they even had their own cookhouse since their food was so different from that of the other workers at the ranch house as well. But at any rate, family members lived in the ranch house and it was kept in fairly good shape. But finally, um, the, uh, the, the heir to the estate decided that it was time to sell the property. So in the late 1960s, the property was sold. Now, remember what's happening in San Diego and elsewhere in the country in the late 1960s. It's a post-World War II boom period here in San Diego. There were huge communities springing up. Claremont in the 1950s had been very popular. University City was starting to be built out in the early 1960s. Uh, Mira Mesa was starting to be built out. And uh, a company named MACO, M-A-A-C-O, that had a division called Leadership Homes, made a bid for and purchased the remaining Scripps uh, property properties in Scripps Ranch. And so this house, Miramar, uh, Miramar Ranch, was part of what they bought. And part of the agreement was that they would keep it open for public tours. And so it is this image that you see in front of you that was one of the images made for the public tours. So this is part of what the public would see when they would come through the house. Notice the heavy furnishings and uh, the pictures all dating back to the period when E.W. Scripps was alive and living in the house. Now, here are some images which I was only given two days ago by Jan Otis, who was a woman who heard my talk up at the Scripps Ranch facility. And so she was a tour guide in 1969 and leading kids past the aviary here that Mackie had, um, showing them the dining room. The dining room, when Sundays, when the family was all home, there might be 17 or 18 people seated at the dining room table. The children all seated at one end and they were not allowed to talk until they were dismissed. Um, another thing of interest, this is the uh, portrait of Scripps, which was at the beginning of the show. So he had it over the fireplace in the main room. And the lower image gives you a sense of how big this fireplace was. He noticed the books, E.W. didn't start life as a good reader, but he certainly surrounded himself with books. So he had a 2000 square foot living room um, and 49 rooms in the mansion. The walking tour of the house took two and a half hours to take and people paid a dollar and a half to take it. About 2000 of them took the tour. Here's another image of the house. This is the tower room. This is where Ellen Browning Scripps lived upstairs when she was living at Scripps Ranch, uh, at, at Miramar Ranch. This is before she built her house over in La Jolla. But you can see how much the vegetation has sprung up. This pepper tree 
um, is huge at this point. But remember, this is 1969, so it could be 70 years old by this point. The image on the right is an image of the property after uh, the leadership homes took over. The Scripps Ranch House is still in place. Um, the aviary is still here. The um, uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool. Some of the housing for the staff is here. And of course, you can see all the eucalyptus trees. Remember, none of this was here when E.W. Scripps arrived. Uh, in the area in 1900. So he added all of this vegetation and all of this improvements. So the Scripps house uh, was actually torn down in about 1973. The vandals had come in after the tours were completed. Vandals had come in and stolen the furniture, stolen the the, the uh, wood on the walls, stolen anything of any value at all. And so Mako finally decided that they would have to demolish the house. The house was demolished and then the thieves came in and stole the, 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 the broken up brick and marble and things that were from the old house. So you cannot any longer see the E.W. Scripps house or even its location at all, but there was another Scripps place and it was the family house of the Meanly family. Thomas Meanly was the private secretary to E.W. Scripps. And he ended up marrying one of Scripps's daughters. And Scripps absolutely hated that. He hated, hated, hated the fact that his daughter had married his private secretary. And so they were sent away in, in, in just, um, he shunned them. He sent them away to live at another property he owned named Fanita Ranch which is more out by the lakeside area today. Um, and so it was only after E.W.'s death that Thomas Meanly and his family were able to move. They bought um, 100 acres of land uh, and uh, built a house and bought, uh, built it next to the pond, which is known as either Evans Pond or Evans Lake. So this is one of the Meanly's sons rowing his boat in that small lake. Today, the area is the home of the um, Scripps Miramar Ranch Library. Before this house was demolished in the 18th, pardon me, in the 1980s, parts of the Meanly House, not the Scripps Ranch property, the Meanly House were dismantled and reinstalled at the Scripps Ranch Library. So if you want to learn more about the history of Scripps Ranch, I suggest you go to the library where they have these actually physical pieces of the Meanly House that was built at the site of the library building itself. Now, 1973, the uh, leadership family, pardon me, the leadership housing was developing all these um, uh, tract houses. Things had changed significantly for the ranch. Now notice in the lower part of the image, you can still see the square which represents and are the walls of the Scripps estate, the Miramar Ranch estate, but lots has changed. Number one, the dam and the Miramar Reservoir. This is just a little bit of the shoreline that is in place. This is the uh, 1960s. The, the uh, sewage treatment plant is here. Roads have been extended. Uh, at the very bottom of the image, here's Pomerado Road. Uh, there are Im even some improvements south of the Pomerado Road. So you have some housing, you have U.S. International University. So you have things beginning to happen in, in lots of building going on in Scripps Ranch. But in 1969, pardon me, in, in, the, in the 1970s, the property was sold by leadership to the Corky McMillan Company, who ended up building out the remainder of Scripps Ranch. So you have the, uh, the Scripps family owning it, you have Leadership Homes owning it, and then you have the Corky McMillan Companies owning the bulk of the property before the individual houses were built, uh, businesses were built, and the property was sold to individuals. Now, in 2003, Disaster struck in San Diego County, including the area of Scripps Ranch. The Cedar File 
fire burned through the area of Scripps Ranch. 336 homes were destroyed, 71 damaged, buildings were destroyed, the community rebuilt. The community has a tremendous strength uh, due to uh, uh, them working together uh, over the years. And so they rebuilt the community. So I'm gonna stop talking about the history of Scripps Ranch, but I want you to know that some of the streets that you're used to in Scripps Ranch are actually named for people who were significant or things that were significant um, in the Scripps family. It wasn't EW necessarily that chose these names, but it is uh, these names were chosen because they are reminiscent of some of the family things um, that occurred here. And just in case you're interested and you've driven by the sign with the horse on it that's close to Pomerado Road and uh, where it intersects uh, 15, Highway 15, um, that is the home of the Scripps Miramar Saddlebreds, which was a horse breeding ranch um, and horses shown by um, horses, saddlebred horses raised by Michelle McFarlane and her family members. So you still have family members who are in the area um, and who are carrying on some of the things that the family um, loved. So I am going to stop talking. I am going to come back on screen. Whoops, there's Justine. Um, I don't know how I get myself to be part of this. There I am. Okay, so um, Justine, will you help me with any questions that we might have? Um, yes, of course. So just a reminder, um, if you do have any questions, if you can put them in the Q&A chat. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, um, I do want to let everyone know uh, that Linda will be back in April for a free Tuesday talk, April 12th to be exact. That will be about Japanese American history in San Diego. Um, but like I said, that will be in April 12th. Our next SD 101 uh, will be December 14th, and that talk will be about growing Balboa Park. Um, I also want to apologize for any people who had issues logging on. I know Zoom, something wonky happened, and I know I got some emails with people having issues, so I really apologize for that. Um, this was recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube. We will be sending out an email as soon as that goes up. Um, but I do see some Q&A questions, or Q&As rather. So Linda, um, it looks like one question is, do you have to know how Ellen scripts booth fit into the family tree? Ellen Scripps Booth? Yes. That's the last name. I, I do not, I'm sorry, that's, that's one that I am not familiar with. Remember, with, with the Scripps having had 13 children <laughs> and roughly half of them female that, and then getting other married names usually, um, there's a lot of people who are related to Scripps um, who, are, who are out there. When I first moved to San Diego, there was a little boy in my son's class who was actually a Scripps and he was part of the family. Um, so uh, I think the Kellogg family who are involved with the La Jolla Beach and Tennis Club are um, relatives of Scripps. So there's lots of different families out there. Thank you. Okay, and the next one is, uh, so to understand Fred married his half sister. No, did I, did I mistakenly say that? I'm not uh, if, sure, <laughs> I don't uh, have any uh, context on it. And, and here's the problem with the Scripps family is that they reuse names. And so Fred Tudor Scripps married Emma Jessup. And I probably said Emma Scripps because there was an Emma Scripps in that same generation. He did not marry his half sister. He married Emma Jessup whose family lived in property adjacent to him. And I apologize for that error. Thank you for clearing that up. Uh, the next question is, where was the main home located? Well, I tried to show it to you on the map, um, but today, if you go up and you drive around Scripps Ranch and you come to the area where they call it the Little Lawns in Scripps Ranch, it is right next to the beach, uh, the uh, swim and tennis club. So there's a big parking lot area with a Vons and some other businesses. I think there's a little, might be a little French bakery close by. That is the area where the main Miramar Ranch Scripps 49 room mansion was located. And some of the reminders that you're in the right area are street names. 
because you have aviary named for uh, for Nat um, Naki Scripps's bird aviary that was there at the main house. You have atrium, which was another part of the building up at the main house. So those two streets are in the area where this main mansion was located. Thank you. Okay, another question. Um, how many kids did EW have? He had, I'm glad you asked, he had six kids in 12 years. So he was a little bit slower in that breeding game than his father had been. Um, but only five of his um, uh, children um, were able to live with him. He did have one daughter who was uh, born disabled and they chose to have her cared for by nurses off site of the property. And another one of his children died fairly young. So um, uh, I, I think there were some genes in the gene pool that were not helpful to the Scripps family. Thank you. All right, the next question um, from Heather, she says, love this. And then she asked, is there any history of structures to the east of his home where most of Scripps Ranch homes are now? Well, the, the, the structures that would have been there where the Scripps Ranch homes are, are the, the outbuildings of the mansion. So it could have been the place where the hired help lived. It could have been the place where the farm equipment was stored. It could have been the stables where Naki's Appaloosa horses were, but there were no other houses out in the area other than what was part of the Scripps family. So it isn't like they tore down other housing. When I showed you the diagram that had all those names and all those rectangles showing um, other ownerships in that area, there had been no houses built on any of those. It was all vacant land. Um, so Scripps didn't tear down anything to build his house. It was new construction. I hope that answers your question, Heather. I hope so too. And let us know in the chat if, if we didn't. Um, another question from Jane. What can you tell us about EW's wife? Well, EW's wife, Naki, um, she, she had her hands full. <laughs> she had her hands full being married um, to him. I'm trying to think. I am not remembering their story of, of how they met. Um, but what I will tell you is that uh, I've given the History Center a bibliography of books that are pretty readily available that have some good um, uh, history of the Scripps family. In um, the one that was written by Charles Priest, which is titled E.W. and Ellen Browning Scripps, An Unmatched Pair, there is a fairly good genealogical diagram of the members of the Scripps family. Um, but then all of the books um, uh, talk about the history of the Scripps family members. The most recent one um, that was uh, written by local um, history professor uh, Molly McLean um, is called Ellen Browning Scripps, New Money and American Philanthropy. And that dates from 2017. But there is a whole bibliography that you probably are going to be able to access through the History Center uh, website. Great, thank you. Um, another question, were EW and Ellen both wealthy when they first got to San Diego? Yes, they were, but they became more wealthy. Um, and the reason that they did is that brother George, I mentioned who was very sickly and they brought him out from Detroit and then he died only days later. George was wealthy himself. And um, George left half his estate to Ellen and half to EW, and they each received $750,000, which in 1900 money, you can, you can go online and figure out how much that is. It's several million dollars. And as, in terms of Ellen Browning scripts, because she was already wealthy and she was already deeply involved in uh, philanthropy, giving away money. And let me just say that here in San Diego, we have a lot of things that are named after Scripps. We have, you know, we have the Scripps Hospital and we have um, the, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Up in um, uh, the LA area, there is a Scripps College. And she is the benefactor of these things. She is the one who gave the money. EW gave some support to the Oceanography Institute, but she is the one who really kept everything going. In La Jolla, 
Um, you have churches that have benefited. She built a La Jolla Women's Club. She built a park in the center of La Jolla opposite where her house was located on the edge of the cliffs at the beach. So she was a big benefactor. And when she inherited her brother's, uh, George's money, she didn't even want to accept it. And she finally said, I'm going to accept it only because I can give it away. So she was really, she was one who was very much in favor of um, the common man being able to, to have the money to live a comfortable life and have the things, the food, the cover, the, you know, the clothing. And she wanted to help. She did not live like a rich woman. Um, she was giving a lot of money away. Thank you. And then I saw a question that's related in the chat. Um, Mary Ann asked, uh, where did the family money come from, the newspapers? Yes, the money came from the newspapers and it was the brother James who, who um, first started working for and then bought the Detroit Evening News. And he started to buy small newspapers. And um, James and his, his next in line sister, who was Ellen Browning Scripps, when they were kids, they were 13 and 14 years old, they started a family newspaper just for the members of their family in the area. And um, yeah, a three page newsletter, which they wrote every week. And so that news, having a newspaper and having the idea of deadlines. And, and then when, when Ellen Browning in particular got to the Detroit News and said, you know what, there's some things you can do to make some more money. And there's some ways you can save money. And so it was her brains and James's ability to control things that led them to buy smaller papers, change how they were doing things, make more money, then buy some more papers. And so they were buying up papers all over. Even after they came to San Diego, they were buying some papers in uh, California. So. Okay, next question um, from Daryl. Do family members still live at Davis Miramar Ranch? Okay, so the Miramar, are, Okay, at Davis, are you saying that like this town of Davis? Um, I, am, I am not aware of a Miramar Ranch being located in uh, the Davis area. That would not surprise me. Some of the family members seem to have sort of mixed views of E.W. Scripps and some want to remember him and others not so much. And um, he is the source of a lot of their money though. So. Um, you know, maybe they would move to another community and name someplace there, Miramar Ranch, in his memory. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. Sorry. All right. And we have a few more questions, if you're okay with keeping, keep going, Linda. Um, so from Heather, it says the home was big. Did he entertain often, have many living there, or was it mostly empty? I'm sorry. The home was big. Did he have did he entertain often, have many living there, or was it mostly empty? Um, when E.W. Scripps was alive and before his first stroke in 1917, so from about 1900, when the house was pretty under, you know, under construction, completed until 1917. So during that 17 year period, um, lots of family members lived there and they had activities that they, they had a big dinner at night. They, had, they played cards, they played games, they listened to the radio, they uh, had live entertainment. A few people came in, but it was not a social center as in many wealthy people who are inviting people to come um, to, their, to their houses. That was not the way that Scripps uh, Miramar Ranch was, was operated. I hope that answers the question. And then uh, Daryl clarified about the Davis, um, Miramar, the I-15 and Pomerado. Yes. Okay, I-15 and Pomerado, um, the, um, the Miramar uh, Ranch House no longer exists. It's located sort of where that Vons is. So there's no more Scripps ownership that I am aware of with the exception of that uh, saddle horse um, uh, place that I mentioned where they're raising and uh, show horses and, um, and that's uh, owned by the great granddaughter of E.W. Scripps and the family name is MacFarlane. All right, another one from Al. What happened to Ellen's home in La Jolla? 
Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> the first home that Ellen built in La Jolla, she built um, of wood with a, by a uh, designed by a well-known architect. And unfortunately, some a gardener or someone who had been unhappy with her set fire to the house and burned her first house to the ground. So her second house on the same site was designed and built by an architect named Irving Gill, who was starting to build in concrete and hard surfaces that were not so fire prone. And so that house of, of Ellen Browning scripts lasted for quite some time. And in fact, there are parts of it that are now being renovated and included within the, the newly built and, and created um, Museum of Contemporary Art in La Jolla, which is, I think, fairly close to reopening. But that museum is the site of where Ellen Browning Scripps's home was. Thank and you. adjacent to it on land that she owned and that was part of her garden is the, um, the old wooden structure um, that is it's part of uh, what is occupied now by the uh, La Jolla Historical Society and their archives. Thank you. So just a couple more questions. Uh, Wilbur asked, did Ellen Browning Scripps ever marry or have children or have all the Scripps descendants in San Diego descend from EW? So Ellen Browning Scripps never married. Um, she lived to the ripe old age of 96 and died in San Diego. Um, so there were no children, no issue from her. Um, there are multiple descendants of the Scripps family line. They are more so than just descendants of E.W. Scripps, I believe. Um, but I would, I would turn your attention to the genealogical diagram in the priest book if you are able to go to the library and find it or to get it um, at, look at it at the archives of the History Center because that'll give you more information um, about where the family genealogy lies. Thank you. Okay, and then the last one that I have so far, um, this was asked earlier in your presentation and, and it was when you had the family photo up and they were asking if you could name the rest of the family members <laughs> the <group> photo. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you should ask that because some of them, I am going to use my cheat sheet here. So Virginia is working from left to right. Um, is there any way you can display it again? I, Perfect. I think I can. Pardon me, I'm going to just hop, hop back through images here. Uh, except when things freeze up. So let's see. Of course. <laughs> what is going to be the next? No, no, no. We're, all right. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay, so I'm starting from the left. The woman with the curly hair is Virginia Scripps. Next to her is Ellen Browning Scripps. And next to Ellen Browning is E.W. Scripps. Behind E.W. Scripps is his son, Frederick Tudor Scripps, who married Emma Jessup and who was sent away to live at Fanita Ranch. On E.W. Scripps's lap is his son, Robert Payne Scripps, and that's the son that inherited everything. The chubby-cheeked little boy that's kind of on Naki's lap is Thomas Osborne Scripps, who was Frederick Tudor Scripps's son. So here's his dad, this is the son, father, son. Then there's Naki, who is E.W.'s wife. And then I get a little doubtful because I didn't get them so good. Okay, Elizabeth. Let's see. Okay, Elizabeth Scrip Sharp must be the woman here. And then uh, Catherine and William Scripps. And so usually the wife sits in front of the husband when one of these type pictures is taken. So I'm guessing this is William and this is Catherine and this is James Scripps. So James is the one who started the newspaper dynasty back in Detroit. Okay. Great. And 
that concludes the q and I don't see any other questions coming in. It is almost 1.15, so I think it's a good time to kind of end. Um, I want to thank you again, Linda, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Lots of thank you It's in the chat. Um, and a reminder that our SD 101, our next one is December 14th. That's Growing Balboa Park. And then Linda will once again be joining us in April, April 12th, um, for Japanese American history in San Diego. Um, so thank you, Linda, so much. And thank you for all that joined today. Thank you all. I appreciate you being here. Awesome. All right. Goodbye, Linda, and goodbye to everyone, too. <laughs>